Muy bien. Buenos días, buenos días a todas y a todos. Bienvenidos a la vigésima primera edición de la Conferencia de Santa Luz. Quiero también dar un saludo especial a todos los que nos siguen eh, virtualmente por el canal YouTube de la Facultad de Ciencias Matemáticas, ya que esta conferencia se está emitiendo en directo eh, por, el, por dicho canal y luego se subirá a nuestro eh, eh, repositorio. Después de 20 años de andadura, hoy celebramos una vez más, y con la misma ilusión y orgullo, una nueva edición de la Conferencia Santa Ló. Este año tenemos un motivo de alegría y optimismo extra, porque la situación sanitaria nos permite disfrutar de unas condiciones normales de celebración de este acto. Como todos ustedes saben, el día de la celebración de la Conferencia Santa Ló es un día muy especial ya que simbólicamente constituye el inicio del curso académico y científico de nuestra facultad. Este es un acto especial porque reúne a todos nuestros profesores y estudiantes. A lo largo de 20 años han pasado por esta conferencia algunas de las figuras más ilustres de las matemáticas actuales. Este año también contamos con la presencia de una persona muy relevante en el mundo de las matemáticas, concretamente en el campo del análisis armónico y de las series de Fourier. Se trata del profesor Christoph Thiel del Hausdorff Center of Mathematics de Bonn, quien nos va a impartir una conferencia titulada Convergencia de las series de Fourier y desarrollos recientes. El profesor Christoph Thiel es una figura relevante, sobre todo desde dos de sus más importantes resultados. Uno de ellos es sobre la transformada bilineal de Hilbert, junto con Michael Lacy, y el otro consiste en una prueba simplificada del teorema de Carlson. Estoy seguro de que vamos a disfrutar mucho de su charla y quiero agradecerle una vez más que haya aceptado compartir con nosotros este día. Como todos ustedes saben, este acto lo organiza la revista matemática Complutense, junto con la Facultad de Matemáticas, y quiero agradecer a su director, el profesor Marco Castrillón, no solo su excelente labor al, al frente de la revista, sino también el esfuerzo que ha realizado en la organización de esta conferencia. Después de mis palabras, el profesor Castrillón se dirigirá a ustedes también y posteriormente intervendrá el profesor Javier Soria, del Departamento de Análisis Matemático y Matemática Aplicada, quien, debido a su experiencia investigadora, conoce bien el tema de esta conferencia y nos hará una introducción más profunda del punto de vista matemático. Agradezco una vez más el trabajo de todos los que han hecho posible la realización de esta conferencia, sin olvidarme del personal de apoyo y del gabinete informático de la facultad. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, beloved speaker, and good morning to our audience joining us online from around the world. My name is Antonio Bru, and it's my privilege and great pleasure on behalf of the Faculty of Mathematics of the Complutense University of Madrid to welcome you to the 21st edition of the Santa Lo Conference. We are delighted to have you with us to participate and share in this special occasion. This conference is very special for us because it determines the beginning of the academic and scientific year in our faculty. This conference is organized by our journal, the Revista Matemática Complutense, which is a source of pride for the entire faculty. This journal is indexed in the Citation Index GJCR, and I want to thank its director, Professor Marco Castrillon, for his work as its director and as organizer of this conference together with the Faculty of Mathematics. Today, we have the presence of Professor Christoph Thiel from the Hausdorff Center of Mathematics of Bonn, whom I want to thank very warmly for having accepted the invitation for now from our faculty. Professor Thiele is a great, great expert in harmonic analysis and convergence of Fourier series. He is famous for his work, joined Michael Lacy, of the bilinear Hilbert transform and for giving a simplified proof of Carlson theorem. 
After a few words from the director of the Mathematical Review, Professor Marco Castellón, Professor Javier Soria from the Department of Mathematical Analysis and Applied Mathematics, he will make a more in-depth presentation of the mathematical profile of our distinguished guest. Well, I don't want to take too much of your time. I want to thank everyone who has made this conference possible from the entire technical service to Professor Marco Castellón and Javier Soria. Professor Tille, once again, thank you very much for agreeing to be with us today. Professor Tille is going to give us a talk entitled Convergence of Fourier Series and Modern Development, and I am sure we are going to really enjoy his talk. Thank you all. Professor Marco Castellón, you have the floor. Muchas gracias, Antonio, por, por tus amables palabras. Eh, buenos días. Good morning. Good morning. And I'm just going to give some words before uh, Javier's presentation of the of the today's speaker. Um, it's probably one of the main activities of the journal, the organization of this conference, and in particular for me as the editor of, of the journal is one of my most pleasant activities of the journal. Actually, I have in front of me one of the some of the previous editors and. Uh, to whom I'm absolutely indebted because I am in my hands. I, I have in my hands such a wonderful journal. Thanks for for your job, and I'm sure that for you it was also the one of the most exciting things of the journal being here in the Santalo lecture. Uh, Luis Santalo was a brilliant mathematician in the 20th century, and he was doctor from this university. Um, we we have this in proud of our hearts, and this is one of the reasons of of this gathering of all of us with our speaker today. I'm a poor geometer, so I'm not an expert on the fascinating topics of whom we are, of which we are going to delight today. So I'm gonna give the word to Javier Soria, which is the Vice Dean of Research of this faculty, and it's an expert on harmonic analysis to give us a, an outline of the speaker. Uh, thank you very much, Dankeschön, Christoph, for accepting our invitation. And I know that that is not going to be perhaps the best prize, but for your breakfast, I'm going to give you the cup of the university, which sounds like <laughs> it sounds like a football <laughs> cup, but it is not. It is. It's just thank a you. mug for your breakfast of the university. <laughs> uh, just a small detail of of uh, to show. That we are so happy to be with you here. Thank you. Um, thank you. So thank you very much, and Javier, you can give us some words about the the work of the, our speaker. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Dean, and thank you, uh, Marco. Uh, uh, it's for me a big pleasure and a big honor to introduce Professor Doctor Christoph Thiel. From he's currently the director of the Hausdorff Institute of Mathematics at University of Bonn. Uh, previous to that, after his graduation from Yale University in 1995, he was a professor at UCLA, University of California in Los Angeles, and he stayed there for more than 10 years. He was appointed, in fact, uh, chairman of the mathematics department. Uh, professor Thiel is a leading expert and mostly uh, world uh, worldwide known for his contributions in harmonic analysis, and not only in th that, but in other areas of analysis like uh, scattering theory or PDs or ergodic theory. Um, his contributions have been published in all the, um, the best journals in, in mathematics, starting with uh, Annals of Mathematics, Acta Mathematica, etc. Uh, his uh, best contributions, as uh, the Dean has already mentioned, are the study of the bilinear Hilbert transform, in general, uh, the study of multilinear singular integral operators, uh, also the Fourier multipliers, uh, Carleson uh, maximal operators, and many other uh, operators in, in harmonic analysis. Um, his, uh, probably his best result, or the one that is uh, 
or the one he's most known, is the solution of the uh, conjecture by Alberto Calderon from the 1960s uh, regarding the boundedness of the bilinear Hilbert transform, and this is related to an old problem about the boundedness of Cauchy uh, integral transform on Lipschitz curves. Um, this was a uh, uh, joint work with, together with Michael Lacey, and they published this in a series of two papers in Annals of Mathematics. Uh, they were both awarded the Salem Prize in 1990, so besides the University Cup, he was, has other prizes. <laughs> and uh, he was, just to mention a couple of them, he was uh, elected as an invited speaker in the ICM 2002 in Beijing. And he also received, more recently in 2010, the Humboldt Research Award. Um, the other uh, of his most important results are study of um, uniform estimates for families of bilinear, operat uh, bilinear operators. And this was also published in Annals of Mathematics. And I would also like to mention a contribution together with Camille uh, Muscalu, Jill Pfeiffer, and Terry Tao uh, regarding uh, some multilinear Fourier um, multipliers. And this was published in Acta Mathematica. Uh, related to today's talk, um, and as Antonio has already mentioned, he has a new proof of the probably the most important result in harmonic analysis, or maybe I should say in analysis, but I don't want to discuss about that. Um, which is the convergence of Fourier series in uh, almost everywhere functions in L2. Um, Carlson's theorem is really a magnificent piece of work, but it's not apt for all audiences. Uh, so it's always good to have a simpler proof, and in fact, this is the one that you find in modern textbooks in harmonic analysis. Uh, so just uh, to remind you that uh, his talk is about convergence of Fourier series and modern developments, and it's and I think we are very uh, proud and, and and we are very lucky to have uh, the person that uh, knows best about these topics. So, please, Professor Soria, then Professor Tille, you have the floor. Thank you. Yeah, thank you to the Faculty of Mathematics, Dean Antonio Bu. Thank you to Marco and Javier for the kind words and the hospitality here. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. In 1822, Joseph Fourier wrote a seminal paper where he represented a function on the real line, or rather, say, on zero in the following form as a superposition with coefficients a n of pure wave forms like that. Now, it's an infinite sum, so we like to have some convergence condition, namely if the n's are absolutely summable, then you have, because these exponentials are bounded by one, this is convergent, and we call this condition that the sequence A is in L1 of Z. So he probably didn't write it in this form, but e to the 2 pi i and x, the engineers like to write cosines and sines, so by Euler's formula, this is cosine 2 pi and x plus i sine 2 pi and x. So these are the pure wave functions that we would like to superpose any function of. And this function is one periodic, so you can view it as a function on the interval 0, 1, or a one periodic function on the real line. That's because e to the 2 pi i is equal to 1, according to Euler's formula. Now, you may wonder why I'm writing the 2 pi. Some people like to write 2 pi, some don't. Now, if you write the 2 pi 
here the two pi is going elsewhere, it's not going away. You make the following convention uh, if e to the two pi i. If e to the 2 pi i is 1, then e to the 2 pi i and x is 1 x, right? Looks a little unusual. Uh, for integers n x, depends on what you view the logarithm of 1 to be. So the logarithm of 1 is not unique if the logarithm is 1 2 pi i. Then. So I'll use this notation for today. It's a maybe a bit unusual notation if later in the talk you have trouble following, you can still always translate this back into this. Uh, so what did Fourier have in mind? He had, for example, functions in mind like this one. So let me... Uh, so this is a piecewise. Then, um, and in particular, it's uh, he, he, Fourier was trying to solve PDE. So let's talk about the vibrant equation. This could be a string that you pluck like this. You pull on these two points, and then it's and then you let it loose, and then you try to see what's happening, and that's governed by a PDE. Uh, the PDE is. Let me just write down the PDE. So it says uh, u should be the amplitude at time zero. We just want the amplitude to be a given function f of x, and then over time, the second derivative in time is equal to the second. I'm not writing constants today somewhere. You might want to see some constant, but you can normalize most of the constants. So this is the partial differential equation, second derivative in time equals second derivative in x of this function. And uh, Fourier noticed or knew that these equations, there's a very simple way of writing a solution to this equation, u of uh, tx. If f is represented in this form, you can just write explicitly the solution a n 1 to the n x 1 to the t x. Because if you take derivatives in p and t, if you take derivatives, just 2 pi i n will pop out. The same happens if you take derivative x. So you have, and at t equals 0, you just have the old representation of f. So these, uh, these Fourier modes here, are eigenfunctions of the differential operator. That's the important thing about them, and therefore they can be used such PDE. Uh, so let's see. So this function. Let me talk about uh, this function. Well, what's going to happen? You have these various Fourier modes, and each of them is oscillating at a certain frequency that's determined by that. All right, so let's write down a table, n equals zero. And, and note this function is odd, and oddness is preserved under the PD, so it will remain odd in particular. It's also odd about this point if you extend periodically. So in particular, it's going to be zero always at these points. So you can just view this as a string that's fixed at these two points. So it's just a string that you pluck at one point and let loose. And then it's going to uh, swing. n equals 0, well, because of the function that a, a, and a0 is 0. All right, so this doesn't exist. n equal 1. So n equal 1 is some frequency. It's the base mode, and it's going to vibrate at some frequency. And let's call it. Say it's a, you have tuned the string, so the sound of the note C. In Spanish, it's Do, Do but in English, it's C. Um, so n equal 2 will swing at twice the frequency, and twice the frequency is the same. One octave higher, I'm writing a lowercase c here. 
All right, so n equals 3 uh, turns out your family of his music uh, G. All right, so n equals 4 is 2 2. Octave higher, let me put C prime. Now n actually turns out E a little high, me. And you see, so far, sorry, just a second. The, yeah. wave, the microphone is making like a trouble. Overtones. No, I don't know. Let's see if it works better this way. So you see, so far, is it working better? So far, well, I, I, let me know. So far, you have seen the tones of the so-called major chord. These are all considered in harmony with each other, and maybe that's the reason why the major chord is called major chord, chord because of all this. N equals 6 is double of this G, still G prime. N equals 7, for the first time, doesn't really correspond to a well-known tone on the scale. N equals 8 is C again, C double prime. 3 times 3. So you have the twin twice, so this is E double prime, uh, sorry, D. So that's Re. All right, Re. Well, that's no longer part of the So if you, if, you, if you pluck the string, you have to make one decision. Where exactly do you pluck the string? I chose to plug it here. You can plug anywhere else. And if you want it to sound nice, say, I want that this A7 and A9 are really small, because those are the ones that are part of the um, So you might want to choose, and this will be roughly, if it's at 1 over 7, then you will suppress the A7. 1 over 9, you will suppress the A9. In fact, the A9 may be even more important, say, on the piano, because that one is in resonance with some of the strings. I don't want that. Maybe you want to suppress that. So I challenge you, if you have a grand piano at home, you go home, you open the piano, and you check where the hammer hits the string. All right? And you measure that percentage. Suppressed or not. So uh, Fourier, so that's what Fourier had in mind, this kind of analysis. And he did prove that e every function which is piecewise analytic, like this one, can be represented in such a form. It was, an un, it was a surprise, say, to some people. Euler had thought, well, this puts a very strong condition on such a function, but there's a very general class of functions. However, for example, not every continuous function can be written like that. And the subject, as you know, Fourier said something like all functions can be written in this form, and that's a it, he proved it for some class of functions, and now the challenge is there, which functions can you actually write like this? And I think this, over the, um, over the next century at least, or more, uh, was very true to mathematics, the question. I mean, which functions can you represent like this? And it turns out uh, you develop a lot of concepts. You, you start asking question: what actually is a function? And then uh, you see it in context with this Fourier question. So let me give you one, one observation, actually also known as Fourier time. If you have two functions like this, you can look at the inner product defined like this, and then you just write out. So this has a n, has b n, so you get a double sum. Uh, m x, and then you notice this 1 to the x, well, if n minus m is 0, this is constant 1, well, integral. You get 1. Now, if that's not 0, this thing oscillates evenly, the whole integral will be 0, so this is sum n 
a n b m n bar. Uh, so in particular, uh, now if you choose uh, uh, a n, if you choose g properly, you can do this f of x e to the uh, to the minus just pick the b that's one for one entry and zero for all the others it's going to pick out this a n on the left hand side you just have that. so given this f you can actually compute candidate nicely and that will you other observation is if you do um, sum n, what if you put, put f equals, then this we also write the two norm, and this is we write norm of f. These are one is on zero one. I'm writing L1 is on the integers, I'm writing lowercase l2 of z, just like this l1 of z, this was summable, this is square summable, all right, so this 2 stands for the power. Um, and so this actually says that the analysts like this kind of positive, this is a positive integral use it to define a length, uh, and you have two metric spaces, you have this space L2 of Z, which is a very simple space, it's a space of all sequences, which are square summable like this, so that's, and then there's this other space, which is a metric space, but you can build up, so metric function by measuring distance like this. Now it's actually a space that you don't really, now it's that L, L2 contains L1, but strictly contains L1. So if you have such a square summable sequence, this sum does not converge, I don't know what it means. And in fact, that's where we come to, well, let's try to function. They're actually not functions, all right? They're actually functions. Well, there are functions for a certain class of the sequence. If you have finite sequences, you get trigonometric polynomials. Anyone in L1, that's when you know what f is. But then there are the other where you cannot sum and you don't know what it is. But you, but you know these are dense elements in an abstractly given metric space. We are talking here about Hilbert spaces. And I'm writing the name so that you see we already zoom forward early. Of almost 100 years put forward. Theory of space is developed in part to understand this issue here. Uh, so you can abstractly define this space just as a metric closure of that, and it turns out these are not functions. Equivalence functions, equivalence classes that are only defined almost everywhere. It's getting very complicated. For those just being an abstract concept, so then you have to uh, understand the Lebesgue integral. So the Lebesgue integral is forced on you if you try to understand full The space is there, the God-given, and we try to just to understand what it is. So we put on it a Hilbert space structure, we say it's a Hilbert space, and we try to identify these functions. Right, which are not really functions. Anyway, I'm not going to go in detail on this. I just want to show how to make sense of what it the function can be represented as a Fourier series. <coughs> We've got this abstract concept. 66, Carlson. Um, 
So now you have these Fourier series that are somewhat, don't converge really in an abstract sense. And you may want to say, well, maybe still, and so for all sequences A, L2 of Z, and then Carlson just says, then, and for almost all, all X in 0, 1. Now you have to understand what almost all means. For that, you have to understand Lebesgue measures outside a set of measure zero, whatever. It is indeed almost all. Um, we have the limit n goes to infinity. Now you have to be very careful about the summation method because you don't have absolute convergence of this, but you can certainly exist. All right, so you can, this, this is, this and this is a limit, and the limit may or may not exist. It does exist, and in some sense does represent whatever you want the function to be. Let's not go. Um, so this is a pointwise convergence, which is not at all clear from the abstract concept, and that took until 1960. Um, there was a earlier, around 1920s, uh, scattered over several papers, Menshoff, Paley, Sigmund, was to say the same for same for a in L p of z, where p is between one and two. So you can imagine what that is, and you just put a piece power here and ask that to be finite. Now that. A whole lot easier than this, but it has the problem. So what's nice about this Hilbert space? You are about. Now here, when you do L1 sequences, you know you are going to get some function, but you can't really say what these functions are. They're all continuous, but not all continuous functions can be achieved. You don't really know. E between two, you share the same. You can say, yeah, these A's give you some function suitably defined, uh, but not will be reset. Now here with L2, because we know exactly the Fourier transform side is all the L2 they contain function. So this really, for the first time in history, shows that if you have a continuous function and you write down the Fourier series using these ANs given here, then this will converge at least for almost every x. Not for all x that has been for almost all x. Are there any questions, maybe? Yeah, so it's a's and not on the x. That's hard, too. But putting the A's in LP is a different, not equal to. For P, whether you put the A's or the A's, it's the same. Yeah. So they did almost everywhere conversion under these conditions, which is a lot simpler than the I think this is working. This is also working. forward to 2010. So what's the variation norm? So suppose we have a sequence and then I like to define a variation norm and I write VR for the variation norm. R is some number less than infinity here. Could be infinity too, we have a slight modification. Let's put R less. So that's the soup over all K, the soup over all sequences N0 less than N1 less, less than NK. And then you take the sum 
snj minus snj minus 1, j equal 1 to k, and then you take this r sum. So you've got the sequence, okay. and what you do is you choose points, any number of points, k is the number of points, any points, and then you look at the jumps. And you add up the jumps form, and the quantity you call it form of the sequence. Note that if this quantity is finite, in particular the sequence has to converge. Because if it didn't converge, then there was an epsilon, so that you had infinitely many epsilon jumps. That is tautologically saying that it converges. And you choose all those, so you find all of the jumps here, and this cannot be finite anymore. So you want to prove that a sequence converges, you can prove that it's variation norm. In fact, that's a much stronger statement than mere convergence. It's a quantitative form of convergence. And so here, therefore, this theorem, and this is my today's representative of my own theorem, Oberlin, Sega, Tau, myself, and Wright. And so if A is an L2 sequence, as in Carlson's theorem, and if we define Sn to be these partial sums that appear in Carlson's theorem, A n 1 to the n x, and if, if R is bigger than 2, the following happens. You take this sequence S, you take its VR norm, so if that's finite, the sequence will converge at that point X. Then you take the L2 norm in X. So if a function has a finite L2 norm, then almost everywhere it's finite. So almost everywhere this variation norm is finite, so almost everywhere the sequence converges. And the whole thing is finite. like that. Started with A and L2, so the right hand side. So that's a quantitative. That's uh, useful in various contexts. I will give you shortly one of them. So maybe uh, now I'd like I'd like to pass to Fourier integrals rather than Fourier series. Very simple. We use similar letters. So rather than a sum over z over r. Looks like the Fourier series sum has become an integral and conversely the representation formula becomes a of c equal in f of x on to the minus x c dx. And both a are on our functions. Two on r, so summable for functions on r equal a. L2 of R. We have achieved, we have achieved a great symmetry minus sign, which is not very important. There's a great symmetry between we did everything I said goes through analog particular uh, ah. So let's define a sub t of c. This is play the role of this, and the t will be um, so for simplicity. Avoid some trouble on. Let's uh, let's have all functions supported on R plus. This is the positive half. Oh, sorry. So let, let's have all right. Let's have f supported on this. All right. And, and then I can do the following. I can. 
I define this integral minus infinity to t um, f of x 1 to the x c dx. Uh, so now what I'm I'm trying to do partial. All right, I'm, I, first of all, I'm going from minus infinity to n for convenience. I put the support on the positive half line. This whole minus part is not so important. But I also interchange the roles of f and a. But we have this great symmetry. So prevent us from having the theorem a t of c variation norm in t l2 norm in c uh, smaller equal uh, constant l2 norm of f with exactly the same theorem but in the setting of Fourier integral which I'm going to need. Uh, I forgot to state a cor corollary. Uh, so the same holds for A in LT. One smaller equal P, smaller 2, and R greater than P. And so this is just, all of these are a whole lot simpler than this one. The endpoint P equal 1 is extremely simple. Uh, and the rest is interpolation. So that's not. So now I come and change a little bit further. Now I'm going to tell nonlinear Fourier series or so, but let's do nonlinear Fourier transform. So Let's look at this, this, partial, this partial Fourier integral. Observe the form. The of t, 1 to the t, xi. Right? I'm, taking, I'm taking the derivative of this with respect to t. This is just the primitive of what's written in there. A at minus infinity equal zero. Again, no convergence questions because F is supported on the positive half line. A plus infinity uh, for back to the full integral. So we can basically we represent our Fourier as a process, as some, a solution to an ODE here. And now we can do the following. Look at G T of C E to very innocent thing. We just take X. Well, let's see. Now this also, if you wish, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to turn an integral into a, a Riemann sum and turning it into a Riemann product by taking x, x is taking sums to product, trying to make rather than a sum a product. So I can write down the ODE for this. Just dip the exponential function now. It's itself. So here it's itself, and this is the integral. And g at minus infinity of c because one g at plus infinity has happened. It's e to the a of c. Yeah. It's an writing things differently. But what's the point of writing? This way, now this becomes susceptible placing G physics. And I'm going to look multiplicative matrix groups here. And I'll write, I'll write down for you. There's now many models. I'll write down precisely one model for you. 
So now I can make it non-commutative, but it's actually called non-commutative, uh, non-linear. It's also non-commutative. So we'll write capital G now for a matrix. So we just take two by two matrices. And sorry for using the letter again. Now this A has nothing to do with this F, okay, once and for all, except it's also the Fourier transform. B, T, C, B, T of C bar, A, T, C bar. Where actually, we want this matrix to be what's called the group SU11, never mind, it's just a name, but we do want A, T of C square minus B, T of C square equal one. You can also try to put a plus here, then you have to put a minus here, and that works just as well. But we're just looking at one model. So we like to have an ODE on the group. So let's write down the ODE on the group. E T G T of C equal. Now we need an element in the Lie algebra, G T of C. So we write zero, zero, F of T, 1 to the tx, because that's what we like to write. And then we write f of t bar 1 to the minus tx, which is the bar of that. Now that, we'll have to choose this form to be in the Lie algebra of this group. So writing down, and that's, that's, that's I talk Lie group, yeah, it's completely elementary. If you solve this OD, it's elementary to observe that the solution has this structure and has that disposition. If you put G minus infinity of C equal one, zero, zero, one. And then G plus infinity of C. Again, let's put F half line so that we have no problem with that. And then here we will have to discuss A of C, B of C, B of C bar, A of C bar. Again, this A is not the same as that. It's just the A that comes out of this analog problem. In fact, if f is 0, then a is 1 and b is 0. So actually b looks a whole lot more like the linear. So th these are nonlinear functions in f, but in linear approximation b is the one that's like the Fourier transform of f. a is more like a dummy. Uh, Well, that's a nonlinear Fourier transform, and you may wonder, do we do with the nonlinear Fourier transform? Do like uh, maybe I keep keep this for a little longer. Um, let's do like Fourier. Let's try to solve PDE. Now there's a whole bunch of PDE that can be solved in this way. They're called integrable systems. And for me, integrable systems really stands for there's a nonlinear Fourier transform you can solve it just like Fourier solves the linear. So let's write down one example, and it's called the modified Kortevik de Vries equation. All these equations have names. Um, so let's write down DTU. Well, first of all, all, all right, again. I'll put an initial condition, u of 0x is some your favorite f of x. And then let's put dt, u of tx. So I'm putting a first rather than a second. Earlier I had a second derivative, first derivative here. On the other hand, I'm putting third derivative here. That's fine. You can do other combinations. And now I'm putting a u squared and um, tx partial x u of tx. This is the nonlinearity. It's cubic in u. Mm -hmm. Cubic. Uh, so now without this term, Fourier would go ahead and solve this. All right. Now with this term, we go ahead and solve like this. So we take f and we take its nonlinear Fourier transform, exactly the one over there, a and a b, a of c, b of c. Okay. Of course, we get a matrix, but the matrix is determined by a and b. Now we know we just like to multiply this by 
the exponential depending on t. Now actually, a is just a dummy. We are not doing anything to a. But b, we treat like Fourier did and write e to the minus c cubed t i, e to the i c cubed t. Actually, let me, some constant, plus one, minus one, maybe a half, whatever. So this is like uh, Fourier did. So he took this, uh, he took this a n, and I'm back to, okay, let's put one to the i c cubed t and a constant, he just put n. We put, we take the b and we do like that, but we adjust to the choice of powers here. And then we take the, the inverse, inverse of the n l f t, get u of t x, and that's it. A great miracle that this works system lacks pairs. We are in the 1970s here where people every day found another PDE like this to solve like this. Uh, I mean it has to, there has to be a certain, has to be certain magic to this term and the magic has to play exactly with that. But there's also, there's for example the nonlinear Schroeder equation, you got a second and an I here and you, well nonlinearity is going to work as well and so on and so on. <coughs> Um, there is also a Poincharel. All right, and it's just like this. And let me. It didn't quite check the constant here. It might be one. Into That's an identity. All right, just like the Plancherel was an identity, here's an identity. It's proved by a contour integral. Turn log mod a has a, this log a has a holomorphic extension upper half plane. You change this contour to a big semicircle. You do some asymptotics and you get that. It's not hard to get the idea to do that. Now I said a is this dummy. So actually a, you see a, uh, in fact, that's, so there's probably a two here because a is square root. 1 plus b squared, actually, when the square root, square, the square root pops out as a half, extending logarithm near 1, yeah, I think it's there, I think. extending the logarithm near 1 gives you the b squared, so in linear approximation, this is the integral of b squared, and I said in linear approximation, b is the Fourier transform, so this is, in linear approximation, this is precisely Tancherel identity. In identity, and it's an identity. It's a miracle. There's an identity. And there is now about things like Carlson's theorem. Raising this is now. So if, now let's say, let's say, well, first of all, I was a bit, this was a formal conversation. We haven't discussed yet what the on f, can I do this, and when can I take this limit in particular? We brushed this away, but we didn't brush this away. So when can I take the limit? Now it turns out if f is measurable, L1, the back measurable, the Beck integrable function, there's very trivial Gronwall ODE uh, that shows that this limit is very, the first of all, solution exists, the limit exists, gives you a continuous function A and B, completely analogous to the linear case. So L1, F in L1 of R, um, so then for all C, To infinity B T of C equal B exists, all right, exists, and, and we call it B of C. So that's exactly the same situation as in the linear case. 
Same for A, by the way. Writing B, B is more important, but the same holds for A, all right? Uh, so now if, if P is between 1 and 2, and, and F is all right, and F is in LP of R, then we have for almost all the linear setting as well, limit T goes to infinity, BT of C exists and is equal to B of C. Now I have to tell you how to define B if the limit doesn't exist. Or the, that's functional. I'm not going into this. Anyway, we have a log of this mensch of Paley segment. Sorry, no. Yeah, uh, we have this analog. It's no longer here, the mention of Paley sigma. This is the analog. Everywhere this converges, assume we are in LP. Now, this is actually a consequence of this theorem. So, so we, are, we are looking at an ODE on the Lie group, and we have a corresponding ODE on the Lie algebra. One is a linear, one is a nonlinear setting. Now, there's a theory of rough paths where if fashionable these days, and Terry Lyons started this around 1999, says if, if you've got a variation norm control where r is less than 2, now p is less than 2, so we find an r between p and 2, so that's very important. If we have variation norm control for some r less than 2, then simply the control can be transferred from Lie algebra to Lie group. And then suitable we have actually a suitable variation norm bound. You have to define metrical variation on the Lie group, but you have variation norm bound to this theorem, and that's how this follows. P is 2, then that's a theorem 2. Right? Well, it started being posted, in, but then there was new version. So I could write 21 by Poltoratsky, Alexei Poltoratsky. It's not appeared yet, but there's a preprint that has been quite a bit by now. And it says C, and here comes maybe a slight surprise. Absolute value exists, or to the absolute value of C. Well, slightly weaker, with what you would want that B, but we only know that the absolute value of B converges to the absolute value. So I think room for more work in the near future. I, I don't think there's reason to believe it would not be true for without the absolute value, but at the moment still unknown. Two o'clock, I think it's a good moment. For your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Thiele. So it's time for questions or remarks from any anyone from the audience. So if there is any question, here we have one. Thank you, Christophe. Uh, concerning your theorem 2010, uh, do you have some estimate for P? This um, P here? No. No. P out, P. I mean, the, the, the norm of A in L2 is equal to the norm of F in L2. Ah, so I'm oh, wondering. Yeah. So F in LP, yeah. yeah. Uh, yes, yes. And the. So you could uh, you could put F in LP rather than A in LP, and then you can make a diagram. So you can do one over P here, one over R here, and then you have the point two two, which is uh, which is a half a half, right? Which is the one I was talking about. But I was talking about R should be larger than that. So I'm here, and now uh, um, no, I think uh, let me think. So P. Now that's that's the region we have, and then let's to be safe. Let's make everything open here. 
All right, so you pick PR in this region and you have a bound that if F is an LP, then the VR norm of excluding integral. It's also in LP. Yeah. And you have some, and you have some estimate of the constancy so depending on uh, the const. Yeah, I, we do have. Now let me see. I think we do have. We certainly do have counter examples on this line. I'm not quite sure. I think we have counter examples <laughs> everywhere. I should have to look up. So we do know. Thing is not true on these lines. Actually, no. I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, anyway, we we have no control as we approach this critical. Here, of course, you, you do have you do have r equal one, so that's not the point, and you do not have this, so that's all clear. But but as we approach the boundary, the constant blows up. Uh, but do, and do you know how it blows up? Or uh, no? We don't. We did not figure out how it blows up. Let me not say anything. I'd hope polynomial, but uh, I mean one over this hour, but a wild guess at this point. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Anyone else? Questions or remarks? I have a stupid question, so I don't know if it's going to be interesting or not, or it's probably far-fetched. Um, when I understand Fourier transform uh, from a physical point of view, quantum, classical quantum formulation, and then you have like a transformation of of positions to momenta. Um, is there any kind of interpretation when working with the nonlinear Fourier transform with respect to the quantum approach? Uh, not as much, but there is. Uh, well, what you say immediately think of Heisenberg uncertainty and uh, wave packets and things like that. Um, uh, and that's actually. Um, that's a big problem we like to understand better. Part of the reason why we cannot prove. Uh, so by the way, so this is a purely qualitative bound here. We'd like to prove something quantitative, some sort of variation norm. We'd like to just uh, the linear case and apply here. And in the linear case, the linear case is all decomposing the thing into wave packets, sorting the wave packets. Maybe a little bit what you uh, and it's unclear how to do that because now you have this time t, and you like to have you have this process going from minus infinity some scattering. The physicists actually call it the scattering. There's a lot of physics here, by the way. That is called uh, you could scattering. Aha! This a and b actually have meaning of reflection and transmission coefficient as you scatter away an, a potential. I, I, I'm, I'm saying it simplified, but it's actually true, yeah, except you maybe have to take 1 over b or something, or 1 over a. So you, you, you come here, you have this process, and you wish to decompose into pieces. You say, here's happening something, and you say, and yes, you can. You know, you've got these pieces, and these are all matrices, and in the end of the day, you have to multiply these matrices because the process is really multiplying transmission matrices together. But that's very bad. We talked about that yesterday. Very bad having these sharp cuts. You would like to have smooth cut. You'd like to understand what does it mean to compose two more smoothly uh, design wave packets, and that's impossible. We don't understand that because things don't commute. So you cannot have two things go simultaneously for the same time and then try to understand the integration. So we have some really trouble. Uh, there are a lot to be understood and how, how to do all the kind of wave packets we do in the uh, in there. And that's, I, yeah. But there's all this beautiful, I mean, this, this nonlinear Fourier transform is actually everywhere. So it's also orthogonal polynomials, by the way, if you have the real line, or say on an interval, and you do Gram Schmidt to the polynomials to get orthogonal polynomials. You can also express that in terms of, in this case, uh, nonlinear Fourier theory transform, very 
So it's, it's ubiquitous. I'm sure there's a lot of physics. It's a bit harder to point from it. So last opportunity. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for this very nice talk. Uh, I was wondering because uh, for me as a geometer, uh, what you wrote down there is just the flow of a, a time-dependent vector field. Absolutely. That's exactly uh, that, what it is. That That's amazed it. me that uh, you have some uh, s such a important questions to solve just regarding <laughs> flows of, of time-dependent vector fields. So uh, my question is, what can you do with other groups? Yeah. Other matrix groups and, for instance, other Lie groups that maybe they are not yeah. matrix groups. Uh, so I can't go very far. I can tell you a bit more about SU2. You have a very similar setup, uh, but you have... Um, uh, here you take this log A and I say log A has a holomorphic extension upper half plane, which requires A to not have zeros in the upper half plane, or it couldn't take the log. Uh, now, if I do the same thing for SU2, this thing will have zeros in the upper half plane, which then go by, have names of that, resonances or whatever. Or, In fact, uh, it comes with a PDE where you change a plus with a minus sign. Same. So then you, it's called focusing MKDV or defocusing MKDV. Now, the defocusing things scatter because, you see, it tries to smoothen things out so things scatter to infinity and this may either help or hurt that process. If it helps with the correct sign, the thing is just spreading out. Uh, now if the thing has the wrong sign, so, so this one is the one with the correct sign that spreads out. Now if you have the wrong sign, this is this is trying to focus, this is trying to disperse and what happens, you have these solitones which don't disperse. These are just fixed shapes that go forever. Now these solitones correspond to the zeros of this A for example. Uh, so that's a nice, I was looking for a nice for your question. But then if you go, uh, there are things that's very, there's lots of models. I don't, like in 1D, that, uh, another very interesting question is to go to higher dimensions. I was just one dimensional today. Of course, the Fourier transform has higher dimensions. You could try to do this in higher dimensions. Difficult. It's difficult, but exists. So there are two-dimensional things, and you have other equations. Uh, I guess deep one, but I'm not entirely sure. Whatever. They said all have names. I'm not quite sure I'm saying this right, but there is. So that's a very interesting way to go, but it's getting quite a bit more complicated. And for me, I have no systematic way saying, all right, I can do something for all. I just said, for me, it's example by example. That's how far I can say. But very interesting examples. Each example, flavor, and, and great mathematics coming out. Uh, I want to also thank you for. No, uh, I. Not that you mentioned the uh, higher dimensional case. Uh, is there any advance, any, any improvement, or any new results uh, about the convergence of Fourier series in, or the Fourier uh, linearities? Yeah, no, RM? no, no. The um, um, yeah, actually no. <laughs> there are theorems in higher dimension, but the the problem is they don't. Um, so. So. In one dimension, what you do is you, you cut the Fourier series like this, all right? So you have a multiplier, which is 1 here and 0 here. And then you say, let's move this, uh, let's move this back and forth and take a supremum over this or variation norm in this or a limit in this, all right? Now, in higher dimensions, what you can do, and I'm sure you know that, you can take what's called a Hermann der Michelin multiplier. So you take a multiplier, which like this is has a singularity at a point, but outside this point, it could be, for example, C divided by mod C or something like that, right? Or, or suitable power. Well, actually, I wanted homogeneous of degree zero. So something that smooths outside the origin, but has a singularity at the origin. Now, that's a multiplier, and you can happily move this multiplier around in the plane and take a super or 
and you can prove bounds. So this is what I had mentioned. You know, lacking, lacking better estimates. So what you really want, of course, in higher dimension, for example, you like to do spherical summations, or you like to put a multiplier, which is one here and zero here, and then you let the radius go to infinity. That's what you would call uh, a Carlson theorem in the sense of convergence. You see that multiplier has a singularity along the whole circle, while this just keeps having a singularity just to move it around. So when I say no, I talk about this, I have absolute 20 years <laughs> or longer on that one. Yeah. Yeah. There's all kinds of neat questions, um, other shapes. All right. There's neat questions, but that's not. I think in recent years, either I haven't. Or I... Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe my question does not make a lot of sense. I don't know, but um, so you mentioned that this uh, nonlinear Fourier transform is applied to studying uh, some integrable system. You mentioned lax yes. pairs in particular. Yes. So these lax pairs sometimes are studied through spectral curves. I don't know if there's any relation between. I mean, if the nonlinear Fourier transform says anything about the spectral curve or something like that, or. Well, there is, um, I'm not quite sure what you mean by spectral curve, but there is the inverse scattering method to solve these PDE, which is exactly what I showed you as one example of that. Uh, yeah, lax pairs are, and in how it happens that such a nonlinear PDE can be solved. Yeah, I mean, there's Hamiltonian mechanics of which I'm not much of a special, but you have action angle variables. So I think actually the modulus of this it would be the action variable, and this is the angle that, that moves. So there's a lot of words of which really I'm leaving safe territory here when I talk too much about it. So <laughs> I think what you see, I cannot, other than it interval, but I could go too far if I <laughs> make any more specific claims here. <laughs> Yes, anything else? I guess that now you have realized that in Spain we have lunch very late. So <laughs> it's probably time for, for lunch and for a big applause to our speaker. Thank you very much, Christophe.